Okay, so the first thing that I want to do today is ask if you guys have any questions about research and about getting sources. Or if we all feel like we've got a decent handle on how to do that. Okay, and I want to remind everybody too, it's like you can save yourselves a lot of time and trouble just make an appointment with John Wilson, right? Take the assignment sheet with you, tell him what it is you're working on, email him at john, john Wilson at gsw.edu, and he will help you find whatever you need. Who is that? He is the reference librarian. Oh. So it is actually, it is his job to know how to get stuff for you, right? Uh -huh. um, so, you know, I can answer some research questions for you, but, you know, he knows this, he knows all this stuff inside and out. Like, he knows avenues for getting things that I don't know. So, I mean, you know, I've used his help getting stuff um, at various times. I've also uh, used his help getting, you know, fines eliminated or reduced when I forget to return things. But, um, you know, that's, that's not even a good thing. You heard me. Um, but yeah, no, you know, John, John is, a, is a great guy, he knows his stuff, and he is always happy to work with students on their projects. So, yeah, um, do get in touch with him. Um, so you are going to need to start finding sources um, pretty much right away if you haven't already, because the assignment that's going to be due on Thursday is going to require you to have two sources, right? You're going to be doing a comparison of your two sources. And we're gonna talk about how to do that in class today. That's gonna to be our main focus um, for today's session. Um, plus the annotated bibliography being due Friday, right? Oh, let me um, give you the template for that. So this is more or less what an annotated bibliography ought to look like. Right, you've got your regular source citation plus a summary paragraph that tells me both how you're going to use this and then a little bit about the credentials of the author, right? You know, remember that the author's credentials are actually really important. You want to make sure that you're using um, sources that actually have expertise in this field, right? And they're within the mainstream. So does anybody have any questions about the annotated bibliography? Thursday, uh -huh. are they like, are we comparing them or like are we like having them like argue with each other? Closer to the second. Arguing? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, what you're, yeah, what you're going to do is look for common ground between the two of them, right? It's like, okay, like what, what do they seem to agree on, right? Like what, what, what seems to be kind of like the base level of agreement here? And then look at the ways they differ in interpreting the material, right? So. Find some place where they're talking about the same thing or more or less the same thing and examine the ways in which they diverge from each other when talking about this. And how are they interpreting the same thing differently? And how might they respond to each other? Right? Does it have to be like a traditional like paragraph since we're using like quotations and stuff? Um, no, it doesn't have to be quite that formal. So like, say like, you know, how it was said in the book, it was like, John said this, and this is how the other person would respond, and then we put that quotations, and then we skip down and then do it again, like that? Um, yeah, you can do something like that if that helps, right? So. What, that would actually probably be a better thing to do like for kind of like your pre-writing, right? It's like, okay, so X, source X says this. Mm -hmm. I think source Y would respond this way. Mm -hmm. And then maybe write that into like a regular paragraph, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, think of that as more something to do like during your, your own kind of planning writing stage, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like if you would rather do this as, as more of almost like, you know, like, like a free write, mm -hmm. that's fine too, right? Okay. I'm not too worried about how formally, uh, how, like how this looks formally. I'm more concerned about just kind of making sure that you're kind of thinking about your sources and how they link up with each other uh, instead of just kind of like putting them each in a vacuum. Right. And 
<laughs> using them to plug in answers. Gotcha. And as long as it's got the course. Yep. Um, the other thing I want you to do, I, I don't want you to read all of chapter 10 for next time. We're not going to do all of chapter 10. Um, I just want you to read the 15 pages that are about introductions and conclusions. Just the 15 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that much. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, but yeah, we're, we're just going to talk about introductions and conclusions. Um, that's what we're going to focus on probably the, the next two sessions because these are things um, that I know stress people out and that a lot of people have trouble with. Um, not this class specifically necessarily, but students in general seem to struggle with this. So we're going to do what we can to try to make people more comfortable with introductions and conclusions. Okay. So let's talk about using sources. So when you're evaluating sources, there are a couple of things you want to make sure you always do, right? And we already kind of like, we went over some of this in brief just a minute ago when you guys were asking questions, right? But I think it bears reiterating that when you're going over a source, First thing you want to be able to do is summarize or paraphrase the source's main arguments. Right? <clears throat> what is it, like, what is the point? that this source is trying to make about the subject? What methods is this source using to get there? And also, what assumptions does the source seem to be making about the subject, right? What does the source seem to take for granted here, right? What sorts of things does the source seem to think it doesn't need to explain or define, right? You are also going to want to look for key terms that the source uses. Um, this doesn't necessarily just mean um, like what we've been doing with the vocabulary exercises, just like looking up words you don't know. Um, this is any word that the source seems to be using in a kind of specialized, jargony kind of way, right? So for example, um, the Henry Louis Gates example on the uh, sheet that I just gave you, he uses the term signify capital S in with a G in parentheses. So the fact that this is a normal word kind of altered to make it look strange suggests that he probably means something very specific by this, right? So what you want to do when you identify these kinds of key terms is make sure you can define them, right? Now, sometimes you will have to be, sometimes you'll be able to do that through context, right? So I think that what I've given you here, for example, would be enough to figure out what Gates means by signifying. If you can't figure it out from context, then what, what's the next step? What should you do? Just look it up. Yes, exactly. All right. There are, you know, <clears throat> online dictionaries of philosophy and literary theory and things like that. 
that can help explain some of these kinds of concepts to you. Um, I'll, um, I'll give you links to a couple of resources that might help you with this sort of thing um, <clears throat> this afternoon when I remember to go in and change the due dates for the annotated bibliography, which I promise I will. <laughs> so, what you want to do then, so once you've evaluated an individual source in this way, right? Before you think about whether or not this source's ideas are, any, are valid or whether you agree with them, right? Start comparing it to other sources in the field. Right, so go through and do this with each of your sources and then start looking at them together. And the first thing you want to think about is what ideas or assumptions seem to be shared across the whole field, right? What does everybody who is studying this particular text or this particular author, this particular subject, seem to agree on? Because that often makes a good starting point for your analysis, right? You need to know what, how, how, what the conventional reading of this is, right? Before you can really do your own work. Um, you also want to think about particular sources that everyone seems to cite along these same lines, right? So if you are, say, reading five different articles about Frederick Douglass, and they all cite the same book, right? Say they all cite the Henry Louis Gates book that I've got here, right? Then that tells you that that book is somehow foundational to the study of this particular subject, right? And that if you want to be conversant in this subject, you should probably familiarize yourself with that source too. Because that's the work that everybody else who's studying this has done. Anybody have any questions so far? Everybody with me? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Uh, for a source, is this the one we're going to be looking up? Or are they uh, pretty, uh, in the way, like, bibliography? Uh, which one? Uh, for the sources. Okay, so, yeah, um, so, the, so the sources you're going to be using for Thursday's assignment are two sources that you're also going to use for your in bibliography. Because essentially what we're doing is trying to gather the materials that you're going to need for the final paper. So everything that, um, everything we're working on for the next, um, for the next two, week and a half, which I guess is all the time we've got left, um, is going to be focused on getting that final paper done. So, <clears throat> Once you've started doing this kind of basic comparison, right, you also want to look at these sources at points of reference to each other. Now, there are a couple of ways we can do this. One thing we can do is look for similar or shared language, right? Are there certain particular key terms that they share? And do they seem to define those key terms in the same ways, right? Or do they seem to revise each other's definitions?
You can also look for places where sources directly reference each other. Right? You will sometimes find that your sources will directly comment on each other's ideas. Um, you know, they'll cite each other either approvingly or disapprovingly, right? So you want to look for these spots as well. But the big thing that you want to be doing as you're looking at your sources together, looking at them in relation to each other, right? The big thing you want to make sure you're doing is <clears throat> make them talk to each other. Right, now this requires you to become pretty familiar with each source beforehand, right? That's why we do all this work summarizing and paraphrasing and defining key terms first, right? So that we make sure before we start comparing the sources to each other that we really have a good grasp on what each source is doing and what they're saying. Right, once we know what every source's main arguments are and what their evidence is and what methods they're using, we can then imagine what they might say to someone who comes to a different conclusion about the same text, right? Would they agree with this person's approach? Would they disagree with this person's approach, right? Would they question this person's methods or their evidence, right? And there are a couple of goals to keep in mind here. There are a couple of reasons we want to do this. Right. One, And this for me is actually the most important part of this. It helps you develop your own expertise, right? Even though whatever you're writing on, you know, if your final paper in this class, right, is probably not gonna be the thing you're gonna be studying for the rest of your undergraduate career, right? This method will give you a means of de developing expertise in things that you are more invested in, right? Right, if you apply this to the thing that you actually are majoring in, <clears throat> you can develop expertise in particular fields within your own major, right? The other reason we do this is to demonstrate that right, knowledge isn't created in a vacuum. Right, we move knowledge forward, we move you know, any particular field forward, any particular subject, through rigorous debate and conversation. There's no such thing as having the final word on any particular subject, right? You know, as evidence I present, you know, the dozens of articles people are still churning out every year about Hamlet and Macbeth, right? That clearly, if people are still finding new things to say about this, then <laughs> we haven't exhausted its possibilities, right? So. What you are trying to do here is familiarize yourself with this particular scholarly conversation and carve out a place for yourself in it, right? So the first thing to do is to recognize what your sources are saying and put them in conversation with each other. And then what you need to do is find space for yourself. Now, do either of you have any notions of what you might do in order to do this, in order to find your own, like, your own argument, your own place in the argument? Are you going to do that simply by agreeing or disagreeing with one of your sources? No. 
Okay, disagreeing is probably a little bit closer, is maybe more the direction that you might find productive, right? But it can be hard to disagree with somebody who's studied this all their lives and has a PhD in it, right? Or you know, maybe maybe you have tons of confidence. I don't know. I know that like you know when I was you know when I was in your position, I found it difficult to critique the positions of experts, right? Or like you know they'll say something like smart and you're like, dang, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and you're kind of so wowed by whatever this idea is, right? It's like, oh wow, that's brilliant. Um, that it's hard for you to get out from under it, right? So one piece of advice that I'm going to give you is that when you are going through your sources, right? Look for things they might have missed. or at the very least, don't discuss, right? Something that you can maybe apply the same ideas to, right? But that they don't seem to have talked about for some reason. You might also want to try to synthesize or combine the views of particular sources, right? So you might say, well, I think that source X is probably right about this, but I'm not quite on board with this other thing that they're saying. Whereas source Y, I really kind of like this part of their argument, right? So you can take various parts of your source's arguments, right, provided that you're citing properly. And you can try to synthesize them into an individual position, right? So <clears throat> if you take source X and source Y and put them together, then okay, yeah, I think that's the right way to read this particular piece of evidence, right? This is especially a good idea when you're trying to come up with definitions for key terms, right? If people are defining certain things different ways. You might want to come up with your own definition, say, that synthesizes a couple of different definitions together. The one thing that you shouldn't do is simply be dismissive of all your sources, right? You shouldn't just say, well, they're all full of shit and this is what I think, right? It's certainly all right to look for holes in their arguments or look for places where they contradict themselves or where you know, maybe the evidence could be read a different way. But one should always do this one respectfully, right? And also, like with an aim not to knock other people down, but to build up your own argument, your own point of view, right? And it's actually going to be easier to do this if you are aware of what's already been said about a topic than if you're just kind of going in blind, right? If you know what the areas of agreement are already, then you've got that foundation you can build on. <clears throat> to come up with your own uh, with your own argument, your own point of view. All right. So, do you guys have any questions about this before we try a little exercise? Okay. So, you will see that I have given you a handout, right? That has quotes from a couple of different articles or books that concern Frederick Douglass in some way. 
So what I would like you to do is read the three examples and try to follow as much of this process as you can, right? So start by reading each of them individually and answer these questions, right? Then once we've, once we've done that, I'll give you some time to do that, and then we'll come back together, then, then you'll, you'll go back and um, compare them to each other, right? So yeah, I'll give you some time to start here, and then and we'll continue. And I will give you permission to, um, if you need to use your phones to look up words, go ahead and do that, but only to look up words, right?
So uh, take a little more time. In the interest of time and ease here, let's just focus on the Gates and the Royer essays. Okay, so let's start with um, the key terms you were able to identify 
in both essays and see if you're able to define them. Uh, so what, what seem to be the key terms, like the most important words in uh, Gates's piece? He says repetition a lot. Okay, repetition. Yeah, and, this, and repetition seems to be not only something that pops up a lot, but something that's important to his overall argument, right? Mm -hmm. Good. What else do you notice uh, seems to be an important word here? Obviously signifying. Yeah, this. Specialized spelling of signifying, yeah. Okay, anything else? I'm going to just point out quickly a couple of key binaries here, right? Imitative versus creative. And the obvious one, white versus black, right? So, <clears throat> What do you think he means by signifying here? Like, what do you gather is the meaning of signifying the way he's using it? What's the usual meaning of the word signifying? Okay, I think more the second thing, right? Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the idea to signify is to represent something in terms of something else, right? Um, so, you know, to represent, say, a concept or an object in language, um, or, you know, to you know, draw like, like a symbol that represents a concept, right? Some, something like that, right? So, yeah, that's usually what we mean by signifying, right? What does he seem to mean by it? Can you figure that out? By this unusual way of uh, printing the word. Yeah, he's talking specifically about a kind of black American practice, right? So like they would be like signifying, and then like you know sometimes they add the G. Yeah, because like sort of like sort of depending on where you're ta talking, like it's similar to that idea of code switching, right? You know that you speak in different levels um, when uh, <clears throat> you're talking to different audiences, right? But yeah, I think he's talking about. A sp specifically black American form of expression. That is involved in this process of repetition and revision, right? So when he talks about, for example, uh, you know, he, he quotes this 18th century uh, diary in which this guy is talking about, um, you know, uh, plantation slaves uh, repeating songs that they've learned from their masters and mistresses in a satirical style, right? So signifying often um, imitates white structures of language, but does so um, by turning them around and giving them a different meaning, right? So it repeats, but in repeating, it also changes the meaning, right? So, you know, 
singing, you know, like a hymn that you learn from your white masters, um, but doing so um, in a clearly satirical style, right? You're changing the meaning of the language that you've learned from them then, right? It's not, you know, this, you know, holy and pious, um, you know, prayer and song, right? You're making fun of, you're using it to make fun of the people who taught it to you. So, <clears throat> this seems to be the meat of his argument, right? If we had to sum up what he's saying in these two paragraphs, how would we do it? So it's, yeah, so one thing he's doing is breaking down this binary between imitative and creative, right? Because you're using imitation to create something new, right? So, you know, th think of what, like, the way, um, you know, like, you know, the way hip-hop music, right, often, you know, takes samples from different sources, right? And weaves them together to make, you know, something new in which the original songs aren't always recognizable, right? Um, you know, I, 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 I just learned, there, I don't know if any of you, from this, I'm showing my age here, but there's, a, there's an old Run DMC song called Tricky. Um, and I guess it uses a sample from a song that was a hit in the, early, in the late 70s, early 80s by a band called The Man Called My Sharona. And like, I had been hearing you know, Tricky on the radio you know, for years, like, you know, since I was a child, and I never recognized that that little guitar riff at the end of every verse is taken from my Sharona until you know, somebody told me, right? So they're often taking these structures and changing them into something completely new. I'm and assuming that this author isn't a fan of African-American literature. Uh, why not? I don't know, this, the, I guess the way he's like speaking of it it's kind of like, you know, he's like downing it or like, you know. Okay, so, so I'm, um, um, and stop me if I'm putting words in your mouth here, but it sounds like what is hanging you up here is that it sounds like because he's calling it Im imitative and repetitive, you think that that's meant as a criticism. Yeah. Okay, it's actually the other way around. What he's actually trying to do is show that in this case, Repetition and imitation are the peculiar virtues that he sees mm -hmm. in African American literature. It, its ability to kind of like take and remix the dominant discourse, right? Mm -hmm. So if we had to uh, write a kind of summation here, So this is how I would sum this up. That African-American forms of expression deflate traditional white power structures by taking white language and using it for new and different purposes and in unconventional ways. And I, I get to it, like I can see where there can be some confusion because I've just taken, um, I've taken a couple of, like two paragraphs from a 400 page book, right? <laughs> um, that maybe, you know, taken in isolation or a little bit less clear than I thought they were. <laughs> yeah. 
So let's look at the Daniel Royer essay here. Right? What, what did you um, what did you get from this? What did you get as sort of key terms from this? Take your time, right? It's okay if we don't finish this today. We can always carry this over into next time. Mastery. Pardon? Mastery. Mastery? Okay. Which can have a kind of lo which is a kind of loaded word to use in um, this particular context, right? So we're talking about slave narratives, right? On the one hand, it's talking about mastery as in, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, expertise, right? Expertise in language. But we also have to think of mastery as a kind of term of ownership here as well, right? All right, good, good start. What else seems like it might be an important and meaningful term in Royer's? Excerpt here. Okay. It's like on the last sentence on the front page, learning to read is learning that you're being learned to in Oh, that, 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 yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a typo. Um, for some reason, um, so like uh, some of the journals that are posted to the databases in Georgia View are posted strictly in HTML. And some of the ones that are in HTML have a lot of typos in them, and I just forgot to correct that one. So it should be learning to learning to read is learning that you are being written to, and learning to write is learning that your words are being read. Okay. So yeah, so so yeah, this 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 is concerned with learning and with the process of learning. And then like the last sentence of the is like he wanted his reader to learn something about his own responsibility to the Hicks, so like responsibility. Okay. And responsibility is something that cuts two ways here too, right? You know, that the, the reader and the writer both have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about intersubjectivity? See, I was looking at that word. <laughs> so, can we infer from context what this means? Do you know what it means if something if something is subjective versus objective? So, so if I say something is an objective fact, for example, what does that mean? I learned what this was. It's like, isn't it like objective arguable? One of them's arguable, and one of them's a fact. Yeah, um, objective is something that is factual, right? So something that is objective is something that's not dependent on your personal perception. 
something that's subjective is something that is clearly like that's sort of like colored by your personal impressions, right? So say, you know, the fact that um, you know, say a painting by Picasso is made up of a set of geometric shapes, right? That's an objective fact. But the way you put those shapes together in your head, right, your experience of that painting is subjective. So when we talk about subjective, subjectivity, we're talking about individuality and kind of like individual personhood, right? Now when we talk about intersubjectivity, we're talking about individual subjects interacting with each other, right? So intersubjectivity refers to a kind of Uh, community participation or exchange. So one of the things Royer seems to want to emphasize here, right, is that literacy creates a community for Douglas, right? It makes him part of a different community, right, the community of readers and writers. So take a minute with the Royer, and this is kind of where we'll finish up. But yeah, just take a minute with the Royer and see if you can figure out a way to summarize this for yourselves. And then we'll come back and kind of work on comparing these two uh, next time. Here's another meaning bearing word you might want to think about as you do this. Right? What are conventions? If we talk about literary conventions or say, you know, film conventions, like what, what do we mean? Like large get togethers of people that share common interests. That is a convention, but it's not the kind of convention we're talking about. Uh, when we refer to something as conventional, what does that mean? If like you give me something to read and I said that I didn't like it because it was too conventional. Like one sided? Uh, that would be sort of uh, biased would be a closer uh, approximation. When we're talking about conventions, what we're talking about are norms and formulas, right? So features that all things of a certain type have. You could, for example, talk about like the conventions of a horror movie, right? You know, like a, you know, all horror movies share certain characteristics that make them part of that genre, right? Um, or the conventions of science fiction, something like that, or you know, something like that, right? So as you continue thinking about this, since we're out of time, um, think about how Royer is using this idea of, your, of conventions and what's conventional in his reading of Douglas.
And so we'll, just, we'll come back and finish this up um, on Thursday.